We're now beginning chapter nine, and chapter nine will build on what we learned in chapter eight. Everything in chapter nine will be similar to chapter eight, except that we will be comparing two means or two proportions. Throughout this chapter, we're going to take a look at situations where we want to compare two samples. And the biggest thing you're going to want to look for because the uh, calculations will be different is whether or not those samples are independent or dependent. So sometimes the samples will be independent. For instance, let's say I wanted to compare the average height of men and women. Well, I would find a random sample of men and, and their heights and a random sample of women and their heights. And those two samples would not be related to one another. So I wouldn't be looking at siblings heights or anything like that where there would be some natural correlation between the heights of siblings. I'm looking at a random sample of men and a random sample of women. Those two samples would not have any effect on one another. So those would be independent. In those cases, our point estimate will either be the difference of two means or the difference of two proportions. Again, those would be independent because there's not going to be any sort of uh, relationship between the two samples. Now, in other cases, we are going to have dependent samples. And quite often in the dependent samples, we call that paired data. So let's say you took a pretest and then you took a course and then you took a post test. So hopefully uh, by the end of the course, your score would be better. Now, because it's you taking the test at the beginning and you taking the test at the end, those test scores are related to one another. Same thing if I'm looking at, say, a field and I want to compare what the crop yield is. It's the same field before I add the fertilizer and after I add the fertilizer. So we know there's a relationship between the data. So this is paired data or dependent samples. Now in this case, we're going to have a point estimate that is the mean of the differences. So this is actually sort of just a one sample um, T interval, and we already know how to do that, except that our one sample is going to be the average of the differences. So each difference is going to be found by taking the second observation minus the first. So let's say you took your pretest and you got an 80%, and then you took the post test and you got a 97%. So your difference would be 97 minus 80 which is 17. So that would be your difference in scores, pretest to post test. And then you would take all of those differences and find the average. In this particular video, we're going to take a look at comparing population means where we know sigma. And remember, we have two means, so that means sigma is known for both populations. So you'll notice that I'm going to use a similar, similar slide for all of the videos in this chapter because I want to point out that what we're doing is very, very similar. You'll notice changes here in the criteria, but you'll notice that the steps are going to be the same. Find the point estimate, find the margin of error, and then find the interval by subtracting the margin of error and adding the margin of error. The differences, of course, will be what's the point estimate and what's the margin of error. So let's talk about that for this specific interval the conditions that must be met. The samples are random and independent. So again, independent, we just talked about how important that is. Both population standard deviations are known. So obviously that's why we're going to use this specific test. And either both sample sizes are at least 30 or both population distributions are nearly normal. So pretty much the same conditions that we looked at when we had one sample, we're just looking at them for both samples. Now let's look at the point estimate. So we talked about this point estimate already. This is finding one mean and the other mean and subtracting those two means. That's going to be our point estimate. And then for the margin of error, we're going to end up with our critical value, which we're really good at finding by now. 
And this is our standard error. And let me talk about this a little bit. This is the square root of the variance, which is the standard deviation squared. So I'm taking the first standard deviation and squaring it and dividing it by n1, and the second standard deviation and squaring it and dividing it by n2. I'm adding those together and then I'm taking the square root. And the reason for that is that we always have to add variances. So basically we take a standard deviation, we square it to turn it into a variance, we add it to the other variance, and then we take the square root to turn it back into a standard deviation. And then really here I could have just said x1 minus x2, you know, minus e comma x1 minus x2, oops, x2 plus e, because really that's all we're going to do. So let's take a look. We're going to do the first one by hand. Now, before we go through and find an interval on our own, I also want to talk about what we'll be looking for when we interpret our results. So, of course, we're going to have an interval just as we did before, and we're going to say, I can conclude with whatever percent confidence that the mean difference in whatever we're looking at is between X and Y. We're still going to have that just as we did in the last chapter when we just had one sample. The difference now is that we're going to be very concerned or interested in whether or not our confidence interval contains the value of zero. And here's why. If I subtract two um, population means and find my interval, and that interval contains zero, that means that the two population means could be exactly the same. When I subtract them, I could find a value of zero which means there's not going to be significant evidence that there's a difference between the two populations. Now, if everything is positive, say 1.2 to 4.7, well, of course, that means that the first mean is larger than the second because when we subtracted, we got a positive value. If I had a negative, negative 4.7, negative 1.2, then that means the first mean is smaller than the second. So now that we have all of the background, let's do our first question. A researcher is looking at the study habits of college students, and I'm just going to use yellow for our first sample. So we have a random sample of 42 freshmen, so N1 is 42, with a mean study time of 15 hours per week, so X bar 1 is 15 hours per week. And then I'm going to skip over the second random sample until I find the freshmen have a population standard deviation of 4.7 hours per week. So I have all three for my first um, sample. And now I'm going to go back through with blue and do that for my second sample. So a random sample of 39 seniors. Um, so N2 is 39 reported a mean study time of 23 hours, so X bar two is 23. And then of course a 95% confidence interval. Skimming through again, I'm finding that sigma two is 5.2. So those are the values that we're going to be using through this. Step one, um, step one, I, I apologize. I should have said step one is check your conditions. So my conditions are that I have two random samples, which is good. Those samples are independent because we have a group of freshmen and a group of seniors that are unrelated. Both sample sizes are greater than 30 and both population standard deviations are known. So we can continue. So step two essentially is to find the point estimate. So we're gonna let population one be freshmen, which is what we labeled as we went through the question and population two be seniors. And the point estimate is just subtracting them. So the first mean was 15 and the second mean was 23 and we're subtracting those. So we get negative eight hours per week. Now, before we continue, let's just talk about that. Because that value is negative, we're saying that freshmen are studying less than seniors. Now let's continue. 
I've just recopied our information at the top of the page so we don't have to remember any of it ourselves. Step two is to find the margin of error. And remember the margin of error contains two parts. The first part is our critical value. And we wanted a 95% confidence level. So C is 0.95. And in Excel, remember, we're going to be finding norm S inverse. And we need it to be, if 95 is here in the middle, we need this value, which would include 95 and also the 2.5% here, so 0 0.025. And remember, the easiest way to do it, I can either add 0.95 and half of 0 0.025, or I can also take 1 minus um, 0. Uh, hold on. 0 0.025. Sorry got lost for a second. Either way, I'm going to end up at 1.96. That is my critical value. The other part of the margin of error is to take each standard deviation, square it, divide it by its respective sample size. So again, let your calculator do all of that work for you. Don't round anything in between. And if you're uncomfortable with that in your calculator, let Excel do it all. We're going to do this exact question in Excel in just a moment. But again, you should end up with 2.164257. So that is our margin of error. Step three is, of course, to find the interval. And the interval is found by taking our point estimate, which we had already calculated to be negative eight, and then subtracting the margin of error and adding the margin of error. And we end up with negative 10.2 to negative 5.8. So what's our interpretation? We are 95% confident that freshmen study between 5.8 and 10.2 hours per week less than seniors because they are both negative values. Now, does this interval contain zero? No, it does not. So there is significant evidence to show that freshmen study less than seniors. Let's take a look now at how we can use Excel to do all of the work for us. And I strongly suggest that you do this, again, because the biggest error that I see students make is in their rounding as they are trying to calculate the margin of error. They do a lot of rounding and then they use rounded answers and compute something and then round again. So if we let Excel do it, there's no rounding involved. Um, go ahead and we're going to look at um, how I set this up before I enter any of these values. So the point estimate, I'm just using the same formula from here. Point estimate is x bar 1, which is b1, minus x bar 2, which is the mean 2, b4. The standard error of the differences is all of this. So really that's just all I did in Excel is I said square root and then b2, which is the standard deviation, the first one squared, divided by n1, plus the second standard deviation squared divided by n2. And again, when you're using the square root function, just make sure that you don't close off that parenthesis too quickly. Because some people do b squared, and then they do a parenthesis, and now Excel is only going to take the square root of b2 squared. So just make sure you're very careful with those parentheses. The critical value, um, again, the way that I show it is to say that this area in the middle is the confidence level. So in my case, that is B7. And then to find the area in the tails, I take 1 minus B7. And again, that's going to give me alpha. And then we're going to take that and we're going to divide it by two because that's going to give me the area in one of the tails. So notice what I've done here for margin of, uh, sorry, for critical value, norm S inverse of B7 plus one minus B7 divided by two and make sure those parentheses look like mine. The margin of error is just multiplying the standard error times the critical value. And then of course the lower limit is the point estimate which is B9 minus B12, the margin of error, and then the point estimate plus the margin of error. 
So let's go back to our question and enter in the values that we are given. The first sample of freshmen was 42, so N1 is 42. A mean study time of 15 hours per week. And that standard deviation was 4.7. Mean 2 was the seniors, um, 39 seniors, so N2 is 39. A mean study time of 23, so 23 for the mean. And that standard deviation was 5.2 hours per week. And the confidence level is 95, so 0.95. Notice the point estimate is the negative 8 that we had found previously. Uh, the margin of error is the same value we had found when we did it by hand. And then the lower and upper limit are the same as the lower and upper limit that we have found by hand. Here's a question for you to try on your own, and I would like you to do all of the parts, which means I want you to press pause, I want you to read through the question, First check the conditions, then find the interval using Excel, and third, interpret your interval. And we haven't done much of that yet, but you're going to get really good at it by the end. So when you're ready, press pause, try all of the parts, and then press play to see how you did. So for my question, I'm going to use my first sample as the sample that used uh, the fuel additive. So in that case, that mean was 3,250 with a standard deviation of 748 and a sample size of 50. Uh, and I just realized I didn't check conditions with you. So let's do that really quick. <laughs> so first thing I should do is look at, does each sample size at least 30 or are they from a normally distributed population? We can see that N1 is 50 and N2 is 55. We can also see that each population standard deviation is known and that each sample was randomly selected. So conditions are met and we can move forward. Now I'm going to use the mean one as the fuel additive cars. And again, I've already entered those values. So my sample two is going to be those that did not use fuel additive. The mean cost of those engine repairs was $3,445 a standard deviation of H12, and a sample size of 55. And I'm finding an 85% confidence interval. So again, Excel does all the hard work for me. I just need to be smart enough to know which values go where. But now let's talk about what our interval means. So our interval, written mathematically, and of course, since we're dealing with money, it would be negative 414.16, 24.16. That's our interval written mathematically, but we also want to talk about what it means. And so I have already typed it out and I sort of just hit it back here because I didn't want to have to type it while I was talking about it. So there should be two parts when you talk about um, interpreting your interval when you have two samples. The first part, um, sorry, the first part talks about what the interval means. So I'm 85% confident that the engine repairs on fuel additive cars is between $414.16 less and $24.16 more than those that do not use the fuel additive. So this is similar to what we did when we had just one sample. That's how we talked about our interval. The second part is we talk about whether or not zero is included in the interval. And in this case, zero is between a negative value and a positive value. So zero is inside of there. Since our zero contains interval, there's no evidence that the fuel additive um, reduces the mean cost of engine repairs. So there's really no evidence that there's a difference between the costs for those that had the additive and those that didn't because zero is between my two values. Coming up, we're going to take a look at comparing two population means where we do not know sigma, which is of course more common, um, but there's actually two parts. So there's unequal variances and equal variances. So up next, we're going to look at unequal variances.